Good morning and welcome to Broad Meadow. Here at Broad Meadow, no matter where you come from or you're going, what you believe or doubt, what you are feeling or not feeling, what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all who you are is welcome into this community of faith by God who loves you passionately. Thanks be to God. The hymn of praise this morning is Lift High the Cross. It's number 159 in the hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. Sunday morning, as we begin this time of worship, let's open up in prayer. Let's pray. It says in the Bible, O oh God, that you created the world through your word. Your word is powerful. And so are our words. They can heal, create a smile, be a declaration of love, but they can also hurt and destroy a sense of self-worth. Give us your wisdom, God of the word so that as a church and as individuals, we use our words to build up and not to destroy. Amen. Please remain risen for our affirmation of faith. The historic Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin are on page 881 of your hymnal. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and holy, and it is that church's faith we now proclaim. I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. she raises her voice. Above the noisy crowd, she calls out. At the entrances of the city gate, she has her say. How long will you clueless people love your naivety? Mockers hold their mocking gear, and fools hate knowledge. You should respond when I correct you. Look, I'll pour out my spirit on you. I'll reveal my words to you. 
I invited you, but you rejected me. I stretched out my hand to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored all my advice, and you didn't want to meet me. You didn't want me to correct you. So I'll laugh at your disaster. I'll make fun of you when you when dread comes over you, when terror hits you like a hurricane, and your disaster comes in like a tornado, when distress and oppression overcome you. Then they will call me, but I won't answer. They will seek me, but they won't find me. Because they hated knowledge and didn't choose the fear of the Lord. They didn't want my advice. They rejected all my corrections. They will eat from the fruit of their way, and they'll be full of their own scheme. The immature will die because they turn away. Smugness will destroy fools. Those who obey me will dwell securely, untroubled by the dread of harm. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm today comes from Psalm 19. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming His handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words, their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the ends of the earth. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun. The sun is like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite, like a warrior. It thrills at running its course. It rises in one end of the sky. Its circuit is complete at the other. Nothing escapes its heat. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reviving one's very being. The Lord's laws are faithful, making naive people wise. The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eyes. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tons of pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, even dripping off the honeycomb. No doubt about it. Your servant is enlightened by them. There is great reward in keeping them. But can anyone know what they've accidentally done wrong? Clear me of any unknown sin and save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I'll be completely blameless. I'll be innocent of great wrongdoing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hymn of preparation is in the Faith We Sing hymnal. It's number 2,129. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, the world behind me. gospel lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Please rise in spirit or body for the reading of the gospel. 
Hear now the words of our Lord. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They told him, Well, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and and, uh, still others one of the prophets. He asked them, And what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell, teach his disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then after three days rise from the dead. He said this plainly. But Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowds together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. And you may be seated. When I was very young, I convinced my parents to invest in a full set of world book encyclopedia. I bugged them and bugged them. This is, of course, before the internet was a thing. Wikipedia was a thing. You could look anything in the world up in seconds. No, I wanted, I wanted the World Book Encyclopedia so I could know everything I wanted to know. And every year, I even convinced them to buy the little supplement that came. So the, you know, all the things that had happened that year were in the little supplement, and I would, I would sit down and tear out the little, go see this in such and such chapter, and I'd put it, I'd put it in the in the world book, and so I had, I had this full set of encyclopedias, and I loved those encyclopedias so very much. And to tell you what kind of child I was, I, I read the encyclopedias, and I don't mean that I would occasionally look at things. I mean I would take A down, and I would just start reading the encyclopedia, and then when I finished A, I would read B, and then when I was finished with B, I would read C. I read the encyclopedia. I then had this idea that I pretty much knew everything because I had read the encyclopedia. I knew everything. I had so much ridiculous information floating around in my head. It turns out, by the way, that this is not a uniquely Lance trait. This is a, it's a pretty good Presley trait. We're all fairly certain that we know everything. And so I could not be convinced I was wrong most of the time. I have thankfully, over the course of the decades... I'm a little bit better about that. I can actually be convinced that I'm wrong occasionally now. But I was convinced I knew it all. I had a lot of knowledge, especially for, you know, a a 10, 11 year old. I had a lot of knowledge. I, I did not have a lot of wisdom. Last week, we we began to look at ways that that Scripture, especially what we call the wisdom literature, like Proverbs, 
looked at ways that scripture, that wisdom literature directs us toward a good life. Not the good life, the way we talk about that in, in the United States, not the American dream, but a good life according to, to scripture. This life of, of meaning. A, directed, a life directed towards God. We, we began to look at Proverbs, which as I said is, a, is wisdom literature. It's this, this body of work within the Scripture. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, a few other books that, that tries to, to form the reader into someone who is, is able to look at the world and move in the world in wisdom. Last week we talked about having a good name. What that means. We back up a little bit this week and go to the first chapter of, of Proverbs. Where it's explicit that what's happening is we're listening to wisdom. And wisdom in Proverbs is often, like it is here, personified as a woman. Wisdom is a woman who is standing out in the streets, shouting at the people. And over the course of Proverbs, wisdom takes on an almost divine status. Wisdom is, is treated almost as, as the consort of God. That wisdom has, has stood beside God from the very beginning of creation. And here she is, shouting at people like a street corner preacher. Saying, listen to me. Why don't you people listen to me? Stop being foolish. Stop being clueless. And she gets pretty harsh. And Tracy read this earlier. You heard it. She, without wisdom, there is no life. Not just no good life. There is no life at all. Wisdom, wisdom here throughout the course of Proverbs and, and the rest of wisdom literature in Scripture is distinguished from knowledge. They're not the same thing. Knowledge is a set of facts. It's my 10-year-old self being able to tell you what was in the encyclopedia. It's a set of facts. And having those facts is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. We, we need knowledge. It's a good thing to have knowledge. It's a good thing to know things. It's, it's, good to have, it's good to know math. It's good to know science. As, as we listen to what, happen, what, what people are saying, what our doctors and, and, and researchers are telling us in the midst of this pandemic, it would be really good for more of us to know more science, I think. Facts are good. But wisdom is something different. Not unrelated, but it's different. Wisdom is a posture. It's not a set of facts, but it is a, a posture of an individual being willing to learn. Having an open mind. Knowledge is a set of facts. Wisdom is knowing that maybe you don't have all the facts. It's that you don't know everything. Wisdom is humility. Wisdom is admitting to yourself and everyone else that you are not God. You are not God. Wisdom is a fear of the Lord, which Proverbs says multiple times. 
Fear of God does not mean that you cringe before the Almighty, that you are, are terrified that God is going to come get you at some point. No, fear of God is once again this recognition of your relation to God. That you are not God, that God is God. And God is more than what you are and who you are. Ultimately, wisdom is knowing that you have more to learn and being willing to learn. You can recite all the facts in the world. You can have all the knowledge in the world and be foolish. When you think you know everything, that is foolishness. When you are unwilling to hear what anyone else has to say, but believe that everything that you need is contained within your heart and your mind, that is foolishness and not wisdom. The Gospel story is is a prime example of this. The, The reading we had from the Gospel today. Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? Which is the most important question anyone can ask. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks His disciples. And they say, and Peter says, You are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one who was promised. And that's a great answer. It is, in fact, the right answer. Peter has knowledge. But immediately we see how foolish he is because he thinks he knows everything that that means. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the promised one. Absolutely. You got it right. And then Jesus begins to tell the disciples what it means to be the Messiah. What it means to be the promised one. What it means to be the Christ. He says, look, here's what's going to happen. Here is what it means for me to be God's representative God's expression on this earth. It means that I will be rejected by all of those who believe themselves to be powerful. It means that I will be arrested and killed. And then three days later, I'll rise again. So so Jesus begins to kind of try and get them to understand that that being the Christ, being the Messiah, does not mean that He is going to come and kick Rome out of Israel, that He is going to take up the sword and He's going to lead an army. He's saying that that is not what true power looks like. That is not what true strength looks like. What strength and power looks like is what I'm about to do, Jesus says, and that is face down death itself and be killed. Because instead of hurting anyone else, I am willing to face death for you and even for them. And the disciples and Peter, they did not like this because they had an idea in their minds of what it meant to be the Christ, of what it meant to be the Messiah. They knew. They knew that they were right. Jesus, how dare you say that? How dare you say that? That's not what's going to happen to you. And Jesus, who had just congratulated Peter on having the right knowledge, tells him that he is foolish. Get behind me, Satan. You may know that I am the Christ, but you are not wise to what that means. You've closed your mind and your heart because you think you know everything, and you don't. Listen To me, Jesus says. Listen to what I have to say. Open your heart and open your mind to what God is saying right now because it's not what you think it is.
Jesus is letting is letting Peter know that that he has to be willing to learn. He has to be willing to know new things. And that a relationship with him, a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with Christ means coming into greater knowledge and growing in wisdom. Jesus, don't say that. Peter, you're just being foolish now. Once again, I wish that this idea of foolishness remained in the pages of Scripture, but it doesn't. We still live in a world where everyone thinks they know everything. At the very least, they're unwilling to admit that they don't know. We are unwilling to admit that we don't know anything. And it's worse now. It is, not because of some, you know, we're getting close to the end or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. We have at our fingertips more knowledge than we than humanity has ever had before. You can find out, you can learn anything in the world. Sitting in your seat right now, you can take out your smartphone and look up anything. Anything. You can find any piece of information in the whole world right now. And I I still think that's pretty awesome. It's a great thing to be able to share knowledge like this. To have that kind of knowledge. If nothing else, it is really cut down on arguments about who this actor or actress was in a different movie when we were watching something on Friday night. But we have so much knowledge just at our fingertips constantly, and yet we are still in dire need of wisdom. More than ever, we are in dire need of wisdom. To acknowledge that we don't know everything and we can't even know everything. Our lives, so many of our lives are lived in public. Are lived completely in public. We are on social media, which is in some ways very good, but in in some ways we, we make proclamations about what we believe and what we think we know. On Facebook, on Twitter, on on Instagram, on whatever, all the time. And so it, it becomes impossible for us to, to wrestle with doubt and wrestle with what we don't know privately. We say something that we, we truly believed at some point or another, and, and it's out there for the whole world to see, and then... For you to admit that you were wrong is not just admitting it to yourself, but it's admitting it to the whole world. And nobody likes to be wrong. Nobody likes to admit that they were wrong about something. Nobody likes to admit that they didn't know something that they thought they knew. I've been listening, I've been listening over the last um, month or so to a podcast called The Rise and Fall of, of Mars Hill. Maybe some of you have listened to it, or maybe some of you have, have heard about it. But it's the, it's the story of a, a, a giant church that was founded in 1996 in, um, in Seattle, Washington. And it grew just rapidly, rapidly at, to a, a, a church of about 15,000 people within just a few years. And um, I won't go into everything. That's going on in that because it's. I mean, I'm on like the you know seventh or eighth episode of it, but it it kind of coincided with the rise of the internet and you know and kind of moving into this kind of world of social media, and the the pastors and the the people who were part of this would would talk very publicly about some things and and they became famous because of it at least church famous. And then as, as things changed, they were just unable to walk back from so much of what they had said because they had 
staked their careers and their reputations on being right about certain things. I am right about this and right about that. And that's the whole point of this particular church, that it is right. And so they couldn't walk back when, when things weren't going or when, the way they thought they were or that they had changed their minds. They couldn't, the, the leaders in this church couldn't, couldn't wrestle with that because they've been so public about what they believed. And yet, in this moment in our history, I think it's more important than ever for us to do that. For us to listen to each other and be open to the idea that maybe, just maybe, we don't know everything. Maybe, just maybe, someone else has something to teach us. Someone else has something useful to say. That Lance Presley, at 10 years old, did not know everything. That Lance Presley, at 43 years old, still doesn't know everything, and is probably wrong about a lot of things that I think now. It's so very important for us to listen to one another and admit that maybe, just maybe, we don't know it all. And this is what wisdom is crying out in Proverbs to the people in the streets. Stop believing that you know it all. Open up your minds to God right now and know that you're not God. That it is so very important in this moment and in every moment that instead of focusing, instead of of wanting to win arguments, we we should prefer to learn. To learn. Instead of winning, our goal, says Proverbs, should be to learn. To listen to one another and to listen to God together so that we can grow in knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is is aligning our minds and hearts with God's own love and compassion for the world. Wisdom is is learning to follow God's revelation, Jesus Christ, all the way to the cross. Wisdom is training our minds not to win a debate, but to pursue God. To pursue God in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we are. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are privileged that we are able, even though we do not know everything, even though that we, we are often foolish, that we are able to go to God in prayer. So I would invite you to join with me in prayer now. Let us pray. God of love, you gave your only son so that he would undergo great suffering for our sake. Seeing this great suffering, we believe that you understand the sufferings of the world and our own suffering. Believing that you have walked in our footsteps and that you have lived through trials and tribulations, we offer our prayers to you. We pray for wisdom that we can communicate effectively with love, shalom, and compassion and strive to live in connectedness and understanding. We pray for courage so that we can live out our faith giving witness with our words and actions that you are the Messiah. We pray for the will to take up the cross and to follow wherever you may lead. And we pray for love your love in us, so that we can live with the intentionality to know each other by name and have the deep relationships that you want us to have with you and with each other. 
through Jesus Christ, who lives in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, and who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We're still not passing the plate around, but we do have an offering plate in the foyer, in the narthex. And if you're able to give, I would encourage you to do so. If you're at home, you can send a check in, you can drop one off here, you can have your bank um, draft it to us. We are also, um, we, we made this available online, but also uh, today if you'd like to donate to the United Methodist Church's disaster relief efforts to help those affected by Hurricane Ida, uh, you can write a check and uh, put it in the plate and just simply put, Hurricane Ida disaster response in your church and your checks memo. Uh, you can also go to umcor.org. That's u m c o r.org, and um, and give to umcor, our um, United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, you can give to them as well directly. Uh, every dime that you give to umcor goes uh, directly to to disaster relief. Um, because all of the overhead is already covered by our tithes and offerings. But God has given us the Son and made us stewards of all creation. God has given us our lives and our very beings. Let us give to God from what God has given us. Amen. Our closing hymn is Christ for the World We Sing. It's number 568 in the hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Christ for the world we see. The world to Christ we bring. With loving zeal. The poor news for you. God does not expect you to be right all the time. It's good news for me anyway. No, all God expects us to do is to follow Christ. So for our benediction today, I'd like us to, to sing one last time the, the hymn we sang a little bit earlier, just one verse of it. We don't, I don't, we can just sing it a cappella, it's fine. But I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen.